uh, nonlinear dynamics of perturbed traveling and spanning uh, water waves. Thank you. Great. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. And it's great to be in Scotland. I've never been here before, but I to visit. Um, so yeah, so this is about standing waves and traveling waves. And um, this is joint work with my former student, Shinyu, who's here. And I think a lot of you have met her. She had a poster over there, has a poster over there. Um, and uh, so just uh, as some motivation, uh, on Monday, we saw a couple of talks about rogue waves and um, modulational instability being one of the one of the factors that generates the rogue waves. And so um, what we're interested in doing is looking at these modulational instabilities and really evolving the solutions under full Euler, where the where the unstable mode is evolving with a different um, wavelength than the the base mode, and they can be irrationally related. That's I guess the main motivation for this. And then there was also a paper by Stiasny and and Bryant from the '90s that saw some really interesting recurrence in. Um, uh, some perturbations of standing waves that um, that I think is really interesting. So I wanted to look at that as well. And, uh, so, the, so the machinery that we that Shinyu and I have developed to study this uh, subharmonic um, problem and to study spatially quasi-periodic water waves is is now published in these four papers. Um, two of them are focusing on traveling waves and bifurcations within the traveling wave families. So we found traveling waves that have multiple periods but still travel at a constant speed. Um, in finite depth and infinite depth. And then we've also looked at the initial value problem. And it's the initial value problem that's most relevant to this um, question of, of rogue waves and, and what happens if you follow these unstable modes for a long time. Um, I'm going to build on some previous work. So traveling standing waves are something that I've been computing for a while. Um, I published a paper on that in uh, 2021 or roughly. Um, and so what I want to do is look at these traveling standing waves and their uh, the stability of them with respect to both subharmonic and superharmonic perturbations. So I've done some some work, one one with Olga and Bernard on the instability of Wilton ripples, um, and then one I've looked at harmonic stability of standing waves. So I'm sort of looking for a unified method to to study standing waves and traveling waves to harmonic and subharmonic perturbations. But, so I've organized the talk since I'm talking about long time dynamics. I should talk about time stepping a little bit. <laughs> I don't have that much time, so I'll try to go kind of quickly through this. Also, most of you are experts in water waste. Um, so um, I'll just mention a couple of ways you can formulate the problems. I actually use all of them in, in various parts of the talk. Um, and then, yeah, so we'll get here as we get. The first part, equations of motion, um, looking at irrotational um, potential flow. So U equals grad phi. Um, we have the Bernoulli equation there, um, kappa's curvature, although I think most of my simulations will be without surface tension in this talk. Um, and uh, as we all know, the hard part of the water wave problem is the Dirichlet Neumann operator. So you're solving Laplace's equation. Um, the Zakharov Craig Sulin formulation, you sort of think of that as just an operator um, from the free surface, it becomes non local. So if you're given the velocity potential on the free surface, you need to compute the normal velocity, d phi dn. And then I'm a big fan of the Howell and Grub Shelley uh, framework for thinking about this. So the fluid dynamics dictates. The normal velocity of your curve, but you're free to choose the tangential velocity in any way that's mathematically convenient um, or uh, physically convenient, whatever, for, for whatever reason, um, you, you get to choose the tangential velocity of your curve parameterization. Um, so that's one degree of freedom you have. Um, so um, I have used Cauchy integrals. That, that was sort of the first uh, method that I've Worked with. That was sort of coming from working in an office made of David Ambrose when I was at, uh, um, a postdoc at Courant. And um, so anyway, so this is the most recent um, paper that David and I have written about a flow over uh, multiple obstacles and perhaps a bottom boundary. So the um, complex velocity potential throughout the fluid is defined. It has a multi-valued part, so you can have a background flow. So the, this V1 makes it not periodic, so multi-valued in a sense. Um, and then the phi sill function allow for circulation around each of the cylinders if there are cylinders present. And then on each curve, you you um, introduce, uh, actually in, in the plane, it's easiest to just do complex analysis. So we, we introduce Cauchy integrals with these omegas um, playing the role of, of a dipole densities if you did a double layer potential. And then you've defined a complex velocity potential, but the phi MV makes it multi-valued, or at least the, 
the uh, velocity potential is multivalued, but the stream function is single valued. Um, so in the simple case of today's talk, we don't have any cylinders. Um, and we don't necessarily even have a bottom boundary. I think I only show one thing with a bottom boundary. So if you just have the free surface, then you just get a pair of integral equations where given the, the velocity potential on the free surface here, you need to solve for omega by solving this uh, second kind Fredholm integral equation. It's extremely well conditioned. The condition numbers order one, even as the as you refine the mesh, you can do adaptive uh, grids, no problem with this this type of formulation. So if you do have sharp features or something, then you can um, put more grid points near the feature and still get spectral accuracy. Once you've computed omega, you compute its derivative to get the vortex sheet strength, and then you reconstruct the normal velocity. So that's the um, uh, integral approach or the boundary integral approach. You could do this in two D with uh, throwing away the, the Cauchy integrals and replacing them with double layers, but it's harder because the surface is harder to parameterize. Um, so here's one of our simulations um, just to show sort of the power of the method. It's pretty cool. So we have, this, this does have surface tension on the free surface here. Um, and we here I have zero circulation around each cylinder. There is a bottom boundary here. There's a background flow that drove the, the uh, fluid flow. The particles were moving um, just so you could visually see what the what the fluid is doing, but the actual calculation is just the free surface calculation. Um, so the particles are put there afterwards just for visualization. And almost no matter what you do, eventually this type of solution will end in a little structure that looks sort of like a crapper wave, but often not, not or sort of tilted, um, where you end up with a really fast flow here, and then it slowly pinches off until the walls collide, and then you get a um, splash singularity. So um, a nice thing about well, all of these methods, all of these spectral methods is that you can add resolution as you need it. So for a long time that I only needed 384 modes. And then once the free surface got more complicated, you just add more modes. They were zero. So adding adding things of order double precision to the end doesn't affect your solution. So you can keep resolving as you go. And if you are clever about it, you can put more points near the near the interesting dynamics. So that's the that's the first approach. And for um for a lot of applications I've worked with, that seems to be the best, the best thing. You can't do really do conformal mappings in multiply connected domains. So that is one case where especially you know, by the I would say. Um, representing the curve. So one option is to do a graph-based formulation. If you're just doing fairly low amplitude waves, that's a, a really good approach. And so if you if you're interested in the if you like everything in the framework of Harlow and Grub Shelley. That, that requires this choice of the tangential velocity so that each of your particles is just moving vertically. And then once you do that, you end up with our, our familiar Dirichlet Neumann operator for the, for the A to T equation, and then you don't have to bulk C at all. Oh, by the way, data's uh, the, some parameterization of the free surface. And so here we're doing the graph-based one where zeta is just alpha plus I eta. Today, everything's in 2D, so I will embed things in the complex plane. Um, method two is Halo and Grub and Shelley, where you evolve theta itself, so the, the tangent angle of the curve. Theta is what is the what you use to describe the curve. Um, you, you can keep the S alpha being constant in space at any given time, but it evolves in time. And then at, um, if theta t is V plus I u, so that's the tangential and normal velocity of the curve. Um, then the equations that govern how the arc length and the angle evolve can be determined by saying zeta, zeta alpha t equals zeta t alpha. And that gives you these equations. So how long, long have and Shelley proposed um, solving the, these ODEs to evolve the curve? And that's a really um, nice approach. One problem that comes up is that you can get a little bit of a mismatch that some values of S alpha and functions theta don't actually give you a periodic curve. And so one thing that we did in the paper that I showed for the, with the multiple obstacles is that it, you can just evolve p theta, the proje you project out the mean and evolve this as an ODE, and then reconstruct the constant mode of theta and the arc length as an algebraic equation. And then you don't have that constraint issue where you could have incompatible S alphas and thetas, especially inside of Runge cut stages that could cause trouble. So this is a nice method too. A method that Shinyu and I have used to go to, um, to move to quasi-periodic solutions is the conformal mapping approach, which I learned from Paul. Um, years ago, 10 years ago. Um, so here, what you do is you choose your tangential velocity to keep the, the um, eta and, or yeah, to keep eta and C um, related by a Hilbert transform so that you actually have a, you're, you're looking at the, the a boundary of a conformal mapping. 
And so you want eta to be the, the Hilbert transform of C of alpha minus alpha. The alpha sets the scale so that it, as you go far away, um, your conformal map sort of approaches the identity function. And um, you also have the expectation, but there's the complex velocity potential. And the nice thing about this is that you can just take the, with the Hilbert transform, you can just take a tangential derivative of, of uh, the conjugate variable psi, the stream function, and that will tell you the normal velocity of the curve. So you end up only having to apply Hilbert transforms instead of doing the, the Cauchy integrals. Um, this, I guess, I was attributing to to uh, Zakharov and Yachenkov, although I guess there was one in 74. Who, <laughs> so anyway, um, they're the, certainly the ones who popularized this method. So um, if you take the, the time derivative of the conformal map and um, divide it by the space derivative of the conformal map, um, those should also be, that should also be a conformal function. So that tells you that V over S alpha and, and U over S alpha should also be related by a Hilbert transform. And so this is a way to figure out what tangential velocity will um, maintain your conformal relationship between the real and imaginary parts of your curve. And so as long as you define V um, over S alpha through this, um, and V involves the stream function and everything. But anyway, this is the derivation that shows how to only evolve eta and then to, um, to uh, get C for free using, um, using the, the, the fact that this ratio is, is also an analytic function of log. So there's one annoying detail of the conformal map that the reconstructing the curve as you're evolving, um, there's sort of an unknown constant that you have to figure out. So you can, you can um, derive that the constant should satisfy an ODE. Unfortunately, often you don't actually have to satisfy or solve the ODE. You can figure out what constant to put here to, to know what the answer dx0, dt is. And, and uh, the Bernoulli equation within the conformal framework also turns out to be quite nice, just involving um, uh, polynomials in the, in the um, derivatives of phi and psi and, and a Hilbert transform as well. But the, this is the simplest set of equations you can get for the water wave in terms of um, how complex it is to actually solve. T time stepping is largely just FFTs. Um, so that constant C thing to deal with dx0 dt, um, in infinite depth, you can just set C to zero and then x0 will stay zero. In finite depth, you actually have to define C in a certain way to have x0 be zero, but that does work. Um, another convenient choice that, that um, what I've used a lot is just to require that C of zero T remain zero. So you always have your initial um, alpha equals zero point corresponding to physically to X equals zero. And that requires a different choice of C, but any of those is fine. And then you don't actually have to solve that. Yeah. Reconstruction. So the, the equations of motion actually tell you how the derivatives evolve, but they don't tell you the, the actual curve shape itself. Um, but probably when you, when you make a movie, you do want to know how the curve has translated. Um, so you have to do that too. So ultimately, this is the set of equations. Um, you, if you have surface tension, um, especially if it's large sur surface tension, then it's then it's useful to use how low and Grubb and Shelley's small scale decomposition. So taking that, they did it for a multi-step method, but you can embed that in an exponential time differencing framework where you treat the linear, sort of the leading linear part of the evolution equations either exactly like exponentially or um, using or implicitly use an additive Runge-Kata method or something. And then the nonlinear part you treat explicitly. And this allows you to take large time steps without um, CFL conditions forcing you to, to um, take tiny steps and end up with all, because of the second derivatives here. Um, but um, in, if there's no surface tension, then you can just use a high order uh, Runge-Kata method. And I think all the simulations that I'm presenting here are actually with zero surface tension, in which case we either, either use the fifth or eighth order garland prince runge kata So that's the... Um, that's the, those are the equations of motion and a, a really nice feature um, of, of the um, conformal mapping approach is that it generalizes really nicely to the spatially quasi-periodic setting because the, the, the place where you're doing Dirichlet-Neumann operators have just been turned into Hilbert transforms. And it turns out those Hilbert transforms work fine if you have multiple periods, like the, you, know, you know what to do with the Hilbert transform for, um, for arbitrary functions, you don't have to do it with just a single reflex. So let me show you that and explain what a quasi-periodic um, function is. So I, I have a function u, it's a function of one uh, variable alpha. So alpha runs over the whole real line, but we also have a torus function u tilde. So that lives on some higher dimensional torus and usually we just do two dimensions. Um, so u tilde is 
periodic in both both slots. And what you do is to, to get your one dimensional function is you just evaluate along some some direction within the torus. So some characteristic characteristic direction. We usually take k1 equals one and k2 equals k. So that has a certain slope through the torus. If it's irrational, then as you as you move along that, you'll wrap around the torus and eventually get it arbitrarily close to any point in the torus. So um, with a periodic function, you now have a quasi-periodic function on the whole real line, uh, periodic but higher dimension. Um, so if we so where does the Hilbert transform come up for us? Well, we were looking at um, usually Neumann operators, so we were extending analytically into the lower half plane and then computing the real part or imaginary part from the from the from the other one. Um, so the way this works in the periodic case actually works the same for this quasi-periodic case. You you just take half of the frequency if if the function was real then um u hat minus j will be equal to u hat j bar so then you, what you do is you throw away half of the components so if you extend to the lower half plane you throw away the ak greater than or equal to zero um components of that and then you just sum this thing if you take the real part of this you'll get u back um but if you take the imaginary part you'll you'll get um another formula which involves the the, the hilbert transform that we're all familiar with and it didn't actually care what our what our frequencies were it just cared about the sign of that inner product of j okay um so k is our r2 irrational directions and and j are the four a modes j1 and j2 in the in the torus expansion here so sum over j1 j2 of u hat j1 j2 e to the i j1 alpha 1 plus j2 alpha 2 um so um if we do this quasi-periodic extension into the into the or if we if we do this analytic continuation of this function of one variable, it turns out to also be quasi-periodic on slices as you go down. So you, so you also have torus functions going all the way down. If you evaluate any of them along one of these slices, you actually get an analytic function with respect to w, which I'm which is alpha plus i beta. Um, that's been my favorite notation for a while. So um, so that so so. Um, so then if you want the imaginary part given the real part or the real part given the imaginary part, you just end up having to multiply by this Fourier symbol, which is familiar from our periodic um, Hilbert transform already. And so um, it turns out that the, um, that the principal value definition of the Hilbert transform, which is clear that that's the connection with the, with the Cauchy integrals, um, will um, also, you know, it, it agrees with this, but, but you can apply the torus, the, the, Torus version of the Hilbert transform to the two-dimensional function, um, by it's still a, it still has a symbol in this two-dimensional space. So you apply, you take the the two-dimensional FFT, you multiply by minus i times the sign of, of uh, of the inner product of j with k. That determines like you have a plane wave running through there, and you're looking at the um, whether it's a positive or negative number there. Um, if it's negative, you multiply by i. If it's positive, you multiply by minus i. And that's your construction on the torus. And then if you slice through this guy, you get the actual Hilbert transform of the of the previously extracted function. So that's that's a makes it really quick to do the quasi-periodic um, um, Dirichlet Neumann operator. And then we also have to deal with projections. And so the natural thing to do there is just integrate over the torus um, as a higher dimensional integral. And that will be the same as the um, as the limit as a goes to infinity of the integral from minus a to plus a where you divide by 2a uh, of the um, one-dimensional function. So those are all the ingredients that we need to generalize to the Euler equations from periodic to whole real line, where you lift it up to be, a, to be periodic in a higher dimensional torus. So our pseudo-spectral method, um, basically whenever you need derivatives in our Euler equations, you just, um, you just the derivative in the in that characteristic direction um, in Fourier space and for the Hilbert transform um, you you multiply by minus i times sine of j1 plus j2k so that all looks the same but we're doing 2d FFTs now and um, and you're and um, j1 plus j2k is the the wavelength in the one-dimensional thing so that can be very small which would be very long wavelengths if that makes sense uh, um, so yeah so so we just take the equations I wrote down before um, we discretize for, for any time you have a nonlinearity like a power or a product of things, you multiply those in the, in the physical grid on the torus, and whenever you have a derivative, you take the FFT and apply one of these operators, and that allows you to, to um, 
express the Euler equation to evolve your torus functions according to so that when you extract the function, the function that you extracted actually satisfies Euler. So here's um, one of the time evolution calculations that Shinyu and I did. We were, we were interested in just, well, what would an overturning quasi periodic wave look like? So we cooked it up so that initially it's periodic and it has a vertical asymptote somewhere. Um, and then for the velocity potential, we started with a, um, a quasi periodic velocity potential. And I think I picture I started with just this function here which so th because of the infinite slope there's a there's a region here where the the uh, in conformal space it, it it drops very rapidly it's one to one over here but but when it overturns then it's many to one in physical space but it's always one to one in conformal space so the, the alpha one direction is this way this function here is only depends on alpha one so that would still be our our function um uh our our periodic function. And then what I do is multiply by cosine alpha two minus Q in this direction for the for the velocity potential, and then evolve that forward. And then each peak does something different. So you have this infinite train of peaks. Some of them evolve forward in time overturn. Some of them would evolve overturn if you evolve backward in time, depending on just how, how the this characteristic line crosses the, the curve. And so after, um, I guess it was 5,400 time steps to evolve the T equals 2.2. Or 0 0.225, um, the the wave has done interesting things. I think I was showing pictures of the, of, of the evolution of each of these peaks. Each of the each of the waves does something different, and so that I think that's kind of neat that you can actually simulate something on the whole real line, where no two waves does exactly the same thing, um, because of because of the way this uh, cutting through this thing <laughs> exactly crosses the same spot twice. Um, this was a big calculation, so we had a four, 4096 by 4096 grid. Um, on the torus, and then th that led to over 33 million degrees of freedom. So it was a, it was a, a pretty difficult calculation. Um, and yeah, it, it's we're we're doing high order time stepping and uh, spectral accuracy, so we're getting conservation of energy, mass, and momentum to round off errors. So I, I put in bold sort of where things are start changing, but it's 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 maintaining all of those features, which is great. Um, Okay, so that, that's the time stepping part. So I want to talk about traveling standing waves. Um, I have to be mindful of the time. So um, standing waves, I've been computing for a long time. I, I do a, a over determined shooting method. So what, you're do what you have to do is find initial conditions where you evolve the water wave and it comes back exactly to where it started. Um, for, for pure standing waves like this, there's a symmetry where if you manage to get the wave to actually exactly stop, then it will turn around and go through a, the, over a quarter cycle, then it will turn around and go back through um, the cycle it just went, just like a pendulum has that symmetry. So if you know a quarter of the evolution of the pendulum, you can figure out the rest of it. So the way I would do this is look for initial conditions with the right symmetries so that um, if phi stops at time t over four, you'll actually find a periodic And then you do numerical continuation with an amplitude and using Fourier modes is, of the initial condition as an amplitude parameters, it works really well. Sometimes you have to change parameters to get around turning chance of things. But as you go, um, you get interesting, complicated uh, family of standing waves. So traveling standing waves. So these are waves that both travel and uh, um, are time period. So they go through a cycle and they also shift. And so this was the paper I, I mentioned earlier. Um, so what, a, a good definition of it is at a later time, it comes back to a, spa a spatial phase shift um, of itself. So if little t is zero, then eta of xt is equal to eta of x minus theta zero. And same with phi. Um, so that's the definition. It turns out a similar symmetry to what I was describing earlier. So this was the symmetry I described earlier. Here's a symmetry that will work to, to cause this to happen. So if you have eta being even and phi being odd, and then later at t over four, this phase shifted version theta over four, um, eta is even and odd again, then that thing will go through a cycle and end up itself. Um, as you see for that. In the linear regime, the traveling standing solutions end up looking like this. So the um, um, just cosine t and, and, and just um, trigonometric functions of t and x. And so these things will execute uh, ellipses in the, in the plane. So the pure standing waves are going to be this one, where it's just going back and forth, or this one, where it's just going um, vertically. And all the other ones, the perfect circle is going to be the traveling waves. Um, what you're looking at there is the trajectory of the first Fourier mode of the solution. And in the linear regime, those are the only modes that are active. I was trying to figure out like a good way to describe how to, how to fit all this whole family together when you go beyond the linear regime. And this, this uh, parameter beta that, that looks really natural in the linear regime um, does make sense in the nonlinear regime. So I defined it to be 
and this is somewhat hard, to, maybe not intuitive, but what you do is, is you use the one of these properties, the eta of x plus theta over four is even, you multiply by that thing so that this is actually a real number and this is a real number. And you look at the, um, at the angle of that triangle and, and that thing will go through zero to two pi and wrap around and you'll get this family of traveling standing waves. So at, for the nonlinear case, as you go around, the, the thing has traveled. So you have a, a theta is not equal to two pi in that case. Um, and um, um, the, the, this length and this length, I make a triangle out of that. And that's how I define my parameter. And then for the amplitude parameter, I, I use the energy. Um, so here is one particular traveling standing wave. So you'll find that each time this wave comes out, the peak shows up shifted from where it was before. Um, and we can do a shooting method for this too. It's a little bit more complicated um, because we also have to compute or specify beta and the energy, which are um, not something you can just say initially. So those also depend on the evolution of the solution. Anyways, kind of, the calculation is quite similar to, uh, to your true parameters. So we now have this whole family of solutions. Um, traveling waves and standing waves are, are particular cases. And um, as you vary beta, you go through these interesting um, different types of, of solutions. Um, and then as you increase the amplitude, then you start having theta and, and the period deviating from two pi. This is the infinite depth case. You can also do this in finite depth. Um, so stability of uh, traveling standing waves. Um, so we'll start with the pure, the actual traveling standing wave. It's a function of, of space and time. Um, and then we'll perturb that. So epsilon q dot is the perturbation. Epsilon is going to be going to zero. The initial condition um, will have q dot zero of x. And then my notation is the dot isn't a time derivative. It's a, a variational derivative. So then um, if uh, in general, if qt equals f of q, then q dot t is going to be df of q of t q dot. So that's our variational equation. For Euler, um, at least in the graph-based formulation, this is what the equations look like. So the Q, so the um, if you just take any one of these and put a dot, you use chain rules and things and figure out what the what the uh, variational equation looks like. It also will involve a Dirichlet-Neumann operator with dots and things. But that thing is is actually on the original domain, so you can actually compute all of your uh, um, data structures needed to compute the Dirichlet Neumann operator just once and then apply it to all the different columns of the Jacobian as you're evolving this thing through the uh, cycle. Often you have to evolve like a thousand or eight thousand uh, different initial conditions as you're thinking about perturbations and finding eigenvalues and so on. So you can do that in parallel so you evolve all of, all of them at the same time, which greatly speeds up. Um, so stability analysis. Um, this is fairly standard in a way, but um, what's different now is that um, we have like Bloch uh, uh, um, so with, with subharmonic sub perturbations, you do Bloch theory in space, but then you also have to evolve in time because it's a standing wave. So we're, we're more accustomed, I think, as a community to linearizing around a stationary solution in a traveling frame. And then you often think of it as Floquet theory in a way, but now we really have Bloch theory in space and Floquet theory in time. I always try not to say floquet when I'm talking about the linearization around the traveling wave. Um, so the the main challenge when you're evolving the equations with a perturbation that doesn't line up with the with the uh, um, period of the underlying wave is that um, you have so, so you, you can okay what have I, what have I done? Q dot is the perturbation, but it has a different period. So Q tilde is going to be the periodic part, and then it's modulated by this e to the i mu x mu is between minus a half and one half. Um, and then you can write down the evolution of the Q tilde here. That's what I'm doing. But the problem is you do have some places where you have to compute a normal derivative of the fully quasi-periodic thing. Um, but then it gets multiplied by e to the minus i mu x at some point, which sort of undoes it. But you have now a quasi-periodic version of the Dirichlet-Neumann operator to understand. That's the main challenge. Um, the rest of it's straightforward. And uh, once you've done this, um, you'll end up with an equation that looks like Q tilde T equals A of Q of X T, T Q tilde, um, Q of X T of O. Um, okay, so what is a quasi-periodic Dirichlet moment operator? So we start with data that looks periodic times this modulation. Um, and then you have to work out the phi dot Y minus eta X phi X, which turns out to also still have that factor in it. So you multiply it by this thing and it will turn into a periodic function again. So that is, um, if you're doing 
in the mu equals zero case, I think I already wrote down, I already explained how to do this in a slightly different way. So the Cauchy integral approach, when you sum over periodic images, um, you have sum of one over z plus two pi m is equal to one half cotangent z over two. That's where all those cotangents come from. And so in the quasi-periodic case though, the omega, when you've plugged in this thing, is going to carry factors of e to the i mu x. So instead of one here, you're gonna end up with an e to the i mu two pi m in it. So anyway, this is the m equal, mu equals zero, which I already showed you. And then the key idea to make this work, if we're doing the Cauchy integral framework, is try to sum this thing over periodic images. So you include this factor. Mathematica knew what it was. Turned out the Lurch transcendent can sum this thing. Um, and the problem is that this guy converges really slowly. So it would be very expensive to, to actually sum that. It's, it's actually a divergent sum unless you, unless you use a um, principal value. Um, formula, but the Lurch transcendent has a formula which actually now decays exponentially because of the e to minus alpha t. So we can evaluate this integral to figure out what that sum is, because that's how I'm doing my uh, um, calculations of the modified um, integral equations. So you get a new pair of integral equations where you replace one half cotangent z over two with this Lurch transcendent object. Um, and there's another way to do it, which probably is perhaps easier, but I'll do it this way first. Um, where you stay within conformal mapping and then the, the perturbations are easier. And I think that's more like what, what William Choi um, presented yesterday, um, where subharmonic, studying subharmonic perturbations of traveling ways. Um, so quickly, um, our uh, equation, so this is like the periodized version of the perturbation, now looks like an operator that depends on the, the, the nonlinear solution, the underlying solution um, that's evolving in time. But this thing, comes back to itself if you if you if you travel at a speed c which is theta over t so if i if i move into a traveling frame q check there's a bunch of symbols but this q check thing is looking at this solution in a moving frame so that so that the wave will come back and land again at at, at x equals 0 that guy satisfies q check t equals a check of t q check and in the traveling case a check is a constant uh, operator and in the traveling standing case, it is a periodic operator. So here we'll use Floquet theory, and here we just use uh, the exponential. We know the formula for um, y prime equals ay. Um, so um, the traveling case, you have to compute that operator a. But actually, one thing that's cool is that in my approach, I don't end up with a generalized eigenvalue problem. I end up with an actual eigenvalue problem. So that, that's, I think, a, an improvement. Um, and then in the other case, you actually have to compute the whole monodromy operator. So you evolve all possible perturbations forward um, to the time t. You look at that operator, you look at its eigenvalues, and then instead of the lambdas themselves giving you the growth rates, you end up with like exponentials of them. So they live on the unit circle, and it's actually hard to untangle them and figure out which one's which. So that's um, one of the main challenges. And then you can unwind that and figure out what the actual perturbations are. So long time recurrence, um, long time evolution. Um, I'm going to start with the standing wave. Look at harmonic perturbations. They're they're um anyway, this is this is a family of standing waves that I'm showing what some of the pictures along the along the family. But, um there was this really interesting and um a bubble of instability where everything's fine all the way up to here and then it goes crazy over here. And this had this part had been observed before by Mercer and Roberts, but this was new that there's this little unstable mode where there's a couple of uh um unstable things. So I decided to explore that. So that's what I wanted to do. Um this is what I, you know, it's hard to untangle those things, but if you, if you, um, <laughs> you can, um, do a matching actually, like as you vary, vary the amplitude, you can try to figure out which eigenvalues were, the, were agreed with the other ones. And that's a real headache actually. To make that all work. So here's my um, evolution of an unstable mode. It turned out there were two unstable things. One of them had even symmetry. So I restricted to even perturbations and um, just evolved this thing and I found this really bizarre thing. I, it, it grows exponentially, but then it kind of comes back. Um, so what you're seeing here are snapshots of 25 cycles at a time of the original period of the standing wave evolved over, I forget, like 15,000 cycles or something like that. And you get these sort of breathing modes where things get complicated and then it kind of comes back to the original standing wave. Um, so, and then because it was drifting, I shifted the period slightly and ran it again. And then it does this as it goes through some of the cycles. Um, and we are skipping forward by a lot. So this is jumping, like you're seeing 25 at a time, but you're jumping by that by um, 500 or so per, per cycle. 
so you have this really interesting dynamics that's going on and it didn't turn out to be all that uh it's, it's very low dimensional dynamics even though it's an infinite dimensional problem um so to try to understand that so here's the underlying standing wave um here are the um eigenvalues of the unstable modes so there's two that are unstable forward in time and two that are unstable backward in time so there are four of them um or well actually i'm looking at real and imaginary parts there's two of them there's one forward in time one backward in time but i'm looking at real and imaginary parts and so there's this four-dimensional real space um functions that you evolve there and so what i what i decided to do is project the full dynamics onto this this four-dimensional space and then just look at residuals and so what, what you're seeing here, the amplitude of the projection into that four-dimensional space oscillating. Um, and as you're going through these cycles, when you're down here, you're really close to the, to the underlying traveling wave. And as you get up here, you're in that kind of crazy state where you're really far from the, or sorry, I'm saying traveling, but it's far from the standing wave. And this, this is when you're, I think, far from it, and that's when you're close to it. And so you, you get this really surprising recurrences where it goes away, it deviates, and then it comes back and gets close to the standing wave and stays there for a long time. And how long it stays there sort of varies. So like down here, it got really close and stayed for a long time, and then it grew exponentially. So what's happening is it's going exponentially away. There's something out there. It comes back, flying in along the, the, the un or it's unstable backward in time, but it's flying in along the stable <laughs> mode and, um, and coming back to the standing wave. And so I, I think it's kind of like this thing where, where you... Um, the intermediate axis theorem when you're in space, like the <laughs> object, it, it just keeps cycling back and forth between the um, between these two states, and it stays there for a while. But what's strange is in this case, there's only one degree of freedom <clears throat> other than the, the <clears throat> extending state. And in our case, there should be infinite many, infinitely many things you could do out there, but for some reason, it goes through this one cycle. So the the subharmonic thing, I'll just very quickly. So I'm I'm looking at perturbations of these. Uh, uh, subharmonic um, stability of of standing waves and traveling waves and comparing them um and then let's see so th these are some plots sort of like what this plot so if you, i also see these 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 kinds of extra things <laughs> um so uh standing waves they look pretty different so this is the familiar uh familiar uh, modulational instabilities for traveling waves in deep water and um, standing waves it seems to come in at a steeper slope um, let me skip this one actually. Skip that too. Um, but for increase the amplitude, so x over two is actually let's get down to x over. Yeah, this one's fine. So here, this is modulationally unstable, but this one, this one is modulationally stable. So standing waves are pretty different than traveling waves. You don't have Benjamin fear for standing. Um, and this is all the different amplitudes showing how they overlap. Um, unit depth we can do, and then 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 neither one of them is modulationally unstable. Or whatever the number is. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to say, so what, what, I, what I'm doing now is like looking at the most unstable perturbation within this really fairly low amplitude um, traveling wave and just seeing how that evolves. Um, and so this is what that does. So what I did here is um, evolve with our quasi-periodic thing, um, one of those modulational instabilities and actually solve Euler for all this time. It actually took 9 million time steps. Um, the um, so that was an expensive calculation, although the, the grid isn't that big. Um, and it really goes into this nice um, shape that we would sort of expect from the modulational theory, but then it sort of decays back down to the traveling wave again um, and uh, goes through that cycle. And I completed that three times and it did the same thing. So it's a lot like what I saw with this. I think there's some really interesting um, math to be explored here of, of self long time dynamics of our perturbations of our favorite uh, instability. All right, so I'll just stop there. So thank you very much.